Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Let Me Clarify. As always, I'm Gus, and I'm joined by Sally. Hello! Sally LePage is our, our resident expert in evolutionary biology. Did I get it right mm-hmm. this time? Am I what this time? Did Sorry? I, did I get it right this time? You did get it right this time, yes. I'm learning. Um, before we get to this episode's questions, I first want to thank our sponsor, Casper. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms, and passing that savings directly to you. Casper mattresses are designed to keep you cool and comfortable throughout the night. Casper is made of supportive memory foam for a sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Uh, I've got a Casper mattress and I tried it out. It's super soft and comfortable. Uh, Sally, I got one I know, as well. Yeah, you got one. How are you liking it? Oh my God, I love it so much. I've previously been sleeping on the worst sprung mattresses you can imagine. And so this in comparison, is, it's just a dream. Great. It's great. Yeah, I just... Oh, a dream. Oh, there's a oh, pun already. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I set one up. I filmed myself setting one up. It took it took like five minutes. It was so fast. Uh, yeah. And you can buy your Casper mattress easily online and completely risk-free. Casper offers free delivery and painless returns with a 100-day period, so you don't have to lie down in a showroom. And did you know, statistically, lying on a bed in a showroom has no correlation to whether it is the right bed for you? You can save $50 towards a mattress purchase by going to casper.com slash let me, entering promo code let me. It's casper.com slash let me, promo code let me. Terms and conditions apply. Free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada. So thank you, Casper, for sponsoring this episode of Let Me Clarify. It's a great mattress. You should absolutely go check one out. Yeah. Um, so I think, is this the, we, we, we have a couple of viewer questions this episode. Is this our, is this our first episode with viewer questions? It is. That's I mean, exciting. That's a, that, Ooh, we're, we're outsourcing it. I, wonder, I want to know now whether the questions are going to be better or worse than the questions that the Razor Teeth team have come up with. Well, let, I imagine better. Let's find out. Uh, the first one here is from Anita, who emailed in, and she writes... Hi, Anita. Hello, I was watching your latest episode that came out and was wondering if Sally could answer this. Uh, is it true that plants grow better depending on the type of music you play for them, such as rap or classical? And if it is true, why would it work? Hope you enjoyed my question. So, Hi, Anita, I enjoyed your question. That's a good question. I think we're starting off well for the new year here. Um, not to make any comment on previous questions. Uh, I had a couple of good ones. You did have a couple of good ones. Um, so this, so do plants grow better with different types of music? When I first thought about this, I thought, of, of course not, don't be stupid. Um, because there's, I mean, there's a whole argument of people like talking to their plants. And that makes a little bit of sense because you're breathing out a little bit more carbon dioxide than you're breathing in. And obviously plants need carbon dioxide to photosynthesize to produce sugars to grow. But just playing the music, like plants don't have ears. They, they don't need ears to grow, don't be silly. So of course it's not gonna make any difference. And I looked into it and I started reading some papers and lots of people have asked this question. And quite a few people have found that different genres of music do actually help plants to grow. I was shocked. So uh, it seems that um, particularly rhythmic music, so it was a group of Indian scientists, so they looked at this kind of Indian dance music where there's a lot of kind of foot stamping going on and they found that actually the plants grew significantly better when they were played music than when it was completely silent. However, and this is a big however, I still question those (laughs) few papers that have been done because you don't know whether, because we know that people perform better when there's music on in the background. It's, it's known as the Mozart effect, but it's not specific to Mozart. It's just having a rhythmic pattern excites the brain and having your brain kind of woken up means that you perform mental tasks better. So it's quite possible that the, the farmers, the growers, preferred certain types of music and therefore tended those plants better. So if you're in a greenhouse with music that you like, you're probably going to be happier and spend more time in there. Um, but then, so I was thinking, well, there's a few people who've studied it badly, um, so maybe it does make a difference, but probably not. But then I kept on looking, and it seems there is something to it, because, so all sound is, is air vibrations, is that the air is moving like this, um, it's not moving, like this part of air isn't moving all the way over to here, it's a standing wave. Um, but So it's a physical shaking, and so what sound is doing is kind of grabbing the plant and shaking it. And that is going to have some effect because plants, we know their 
one of their biggest enemies are herbivores, so they don't like it when like giraffes eat them or uh, caterpillars eat them. And that creates a kind of, they both create vibrations. And so maybe they got a way of detecting that. Um, but then scientists looked a little bit closer and found that the ultrasound, so if you think of pitch that's higher than the pitch that you can audibly hear, um, that actually made seeds grow faster. So this was a really controlled experiment that they did. They played them ultrasound and no ultrasound and the seeds did indeed grow faster. And so now we're thinking, well, maybe, maybe it might not even be adaptive. It might just be that the very fast shaking of all the contents in each plant cell causes the plant to be stressed. Cause I think I'd be stressed if I was having someone shaking me at ultrasonic frequencies. Um, and that stress, in the same way that you get heat stress or drought stress or salt stress, that kind of freaks out the plant so that it changes its metabolism, its the, the enzyme regulation and grows in a different way. So it seems that maybe there is something to it that music or at least ultrasonic sound will in some way change how the plant grows we're not quite at a stage where we can confidently say, oh, you know, if you play your, um, play your plants um, Bangra or disco or classical music, that it's going to make any particular difference. But if you like listening to a particular genre of music in the greenhouse whilst you're working on the plants and tending to them, maybe that will make them grow better. So theoretically, it doesn't even have to be music. It could just be sound or whatever, any, any kind, kind of... Kind of rhythmic music, yeah. So the test on ultrasound was ultrasound, not music. Hmm. Is it possible that the vibrations are shaking the earth and making it easier for the plant's roots to, to penetrate and grow down? It's possible. Um, I mean, one of the thoughts was that the, uh, the shaking kind of uh, helps to mix up cell contents so often reactions require just on diffusion and passive movement and so if you're shaking it then maybe things are able to move more um although yeah i'm still questioning that mechanism i think the mechanism is still very much unknown um but it's at the early stages it seems like there is some there's something to it that plants do respond to sound interesting i thought yeah for a little while there i thought you were going to say that in order to control the experiment they were going to have the people tending the plants put on ear protection so they couldn't hear the music to make sure or that... imagine if they had it doing silent disco so they could hear the music but the plants couldn't right right can you just imagine a science experiment where you've got all these scientists in lab coats and greenhouses with silent disco headphones on, just oh. tending their plants no, that, I, I think uh, I think I, I see some some future experiments uh, for, yeah. for for someone to run. Uh, I mean, that sounds like a fun experiment to do, right? Grow a load of flowers whilst having a rave. Hopefully, you enjoy the music. Yes, very much so. So uh, our next question is also uh, user submitted. It's from a user on the Rustit.com website. Uh, I don't know how to say their name. I think it's Ad Swell Fit. Uh, I hope I Ad got that right. Ad Swell Fit. Ad Swell Fit. Uh, hi, Sally Gus. Uh, sl Sally slash Gus, I think that's both of us. Uh, I have a question for, let me clarify. I heard there are mosquitoes that have been down in the tunnels in underground so long they have evolved to a separate species than any above ground. Is this true? Another great question. Damn it, um, two for two this week. Yeah, no, really good. Well done, audience. Um, yeah, great questions. So again, I'd kind of heard rumors about this, but I wanted to look into it a little bit more. And amazingly, there kind of is some truth to this. Hmm. So we got the common house mosquito, um, which although it's called the common house mosquito, actually prefers to bite birds and suck birds' blood. It will occasionally suck humans' blood, um, but its main target are birds. And it has to hibernate in the winter because it's so cold. And like most mosquitoes, so when a mosquito bites you and sucks your blood, you know that that's a female mosquito because only female mosquitoes suck blood because they need the blood to nourish their eggs in order to produce their batch of eggs. And like most mosquitoes, the common house mosquito needs um, a blood meal in order to produce its first batch of eggs. And then someone about 20 years or so looked at the mosquitoes in the London underground because so the London Underground, for those that don't know, is the oldest underground system in the world. Um, it's Victorian, 
so it's just over 100 years old or so and um, it's full of tunnels and people would go in there during the Blitz, so the World War II bombings because it's like an underground bunker essentially and people would go down there and they would constantly, you would get all these historic reports of them being plagued by mosquitoes and they'd go down there to, for shelter from the German bombs and would get bitten to high hell with hundreds of mosquito bites and so someone looked in the 90s at these mosquitoes and found that they were this common house mosquito but very different even the behavior was different so these mosquitoes in the underground preferred to bite humans rather than say the pigeons that are also in the underground they didn't hibernate in the winter they didn't need a blood meal in order to develop their eggs and um, they could breed in much closer like more crowded environments basically they were perfectly adapted to the tube and then they started doing some genetic tests on them and we now think that there's actually it's formed a subspecies and this is where things get a bit tricky in biology because what is a species essentially it was what it boils down to we're trying we know that evolution produces all the animals and plants and whatever that we have on earth and it's all a continuum and imagine like you've got a rainbow at what point do you say no this is no longer red this is orange this is no longer orange this is yellow that's the job that biologists have we have to take this continuous variation and somehow say this is one species and this is another species so at its most fundamental level we're trying to do the impossible because we're humans and we like categorizing things into boxes so it's very difficult to say this is a completely different species and there are so many different definitions of species um, most of you will probably be familiar with the biological species concept which is um, groups of individuals animals for example that can't breed with each other anymore and produce fertile offspring but that's one of only dozens of different definitions of what makes a species um, but these two different groups of mosquitoes have indeed diverged so much that they are genetically different they're really hard in the uk at least to get to breed amongst each other a similar thing has happened in the new york subway and actually in subway systems all around the world um, but it's most extreme in the London Underground, probably because it's the oldest. And yeah, and so we think that it's on its way to becoming a new species and is certainly at the stage where it's a subspecies and it's got its own subspecies name. Um, so yeah, time will tell if it becomes its own species. But how cool is that, right? Yeah. That we can actually see evolution within a person's lifespan because mosquitoes have such a short generation time that a hundred years might be something in the order of, I don't know, 5,000 mosquito generations. I'm not quite sure how long a mosquito generation is, um, but it's generations that are important in evolution, not just actual time, like revolutions around the sun time. It's how many times you reproduce that's important. And they've had a long time to do that. Yeah, I actually misunderstood the question. I didn't realize that they were talking about the underground and you're, you're absolutely correct. I thought they were, it was just a generic abstract concept of mosquitoes living underground, not like commuter mosquitoes who harass people and get off at different stops. No, these are the London Underground mosquitoes and they checked to make sure that they weren't just some foreign species of mosquito that had maybe been trapped inside a suitcase and then released onto the underground. No, they think the London Underground mosquitoes are most similar genetically to the London like above ground mosquitoes. So it's probably ones that have ventured down and then just stayed there because there's so many warm blooded humans around to feast on. Uh, eventually, whenever you know it is decided, if they are a separate species, I hope that they incorporate uh, the name of the underground or the name of tube into, uh, into their species. Yeah. Although no, they have actually got a new name for it. Oh. I'm really annoyed with myself that I, I looked it up and I can't remember it. Um, so you've got the two part binomial nomenclature for the name. Um, oh, maybe you can look this up for me, Gus. I'm looking at um, it right now. I think it's C and then the, the species name begins with P. Coolix, and then the Pipians, Molestus. Pipians, yeah, Molestus, that's it, because they molest people. And so the Molestus is the subspecies name. Um, the Pipiens, uh, the C Pipiens is the species, because every species has two parts to its name. And then you stick on an extra bit if it's a subspecies. So if it does become a full species, it will probably become C molestus rather than C pipiens. Uh, as if it's not bad enough that they're mosquitoes, their name also has molestus in it. 
that's like yeah. adding insult to injury. Well, they're named molesters because they were discovered annoying humans and scientists are kind of like that. <laughs> we like to go for funny and sometimes slightly obvious names. All right, well, uh, thanks for watching everybody. I think it went really well with our uh, viewer submitted questions. We'll be back soon with a couple of small changes to the show and uh, we'll be here to answer all of the burning questions that you have uh, and that Sally can help us out with. So thank you so much, Sally. That's all right.